Today, I'm finally getting rid of this rickety thing and I'm going to build myself a real woodworking bench. So I've had this taped on the floor for months so that I can visualize what size bench I can fit into my space. And it's not so big. So I need to pack a lot of things into this one bench. I want traditional work holding, but I also want an assembly table that's big enough for glue ups and things like that. So I decided to do something really crazy and combine the two. One half of the bench is going to be like a traditional bench. There will be a gap stop in the middle. And then the other half is going to be a large assembly table. So this may be a crazy idea, but this is what I got to work with in this small space here. So let's get started. I set out to make one long video for this whole build, but decided there was so much detail in all the components, it was best to split it up. So today we're going to focus on just the base, which I'm going to build out of soft maple from Woodworker Source. After sorting through all the lumber, I got to work on the pieces that will become the legs and stretchers. As per my plans, all these parts need to be around three and a half inches thick. So I'll need to glue up this eight quarter lumber to get to that thickness. The legs will be around five inches wide and the stretchers will be around three inches wide. But at this point, I ripped all the parts oversized, then ran them all through the jointer to clean up and flatten one face, then passed them through the planer to bring them all to the same thickness. I didn't care to clean up those edges because they'll be dealt with after the glue up. I wanted these glue ups to look like they were one solid piece. For most of them, I was able to find a similar grain, or in this case, the same board that was ripped in half to create a more seamless look. Then I begin the glue up process. In previous videos where I've made workbenches, I work on an existing workbench, and that seems to get some people pretty angry. Yes, to build a workbench, you will need a surface to work on. Use a folding table, work on the floor, build or purchase sawhorses. It's not that complicated, guys. Anyway, after all these glue ups, I end up with four legs, four long aprons, and four short aprons. But I really only needed two short aprons of this thickness, and I'll realize that mistake in a little bit. Earlier, I ripped all these parts oversized, so I wasn't worried about aligning them during the glue up. And now I can mill them to their final width. I rip off the bulk of the unevenness at the table saw, then clean up that cut at the jointer and try to bring everything to final thickness at the planer. I've had this planer for about seven years and for the past six months, it's been causing me problems, but I figured it out. There's a safety switch when the cover is in place that's malfunctioning. The wire on the bottom keeps getting fused to the micro switch and I just need to pry it off and then it works. I could bypass the switch, replace it with a new micro switch, or keep doing this and waste a half hour of my day. Instead, I got an upgrade. I posted about this issue I was having with my planer on Instagram and Laguna reached out and offered to send me their PX16 SheerTech 5 horsepower planer. I bought the Laguna jointer with my hard earned money and have been really impressed with the quality. So I jumped on the opportunity to get another amazing tool from Laguna. So far, I'm impressed and I vow to never return to a life with straight knives. This machine is so much quieter than the DeWalt and it actually takes up less floor space despite the larger cutting capacity. Seeing the chips flowing in the top of the machine is a really nice touch. And my favorite feature so far is the digital readout for repeated accuracy. The DeWalt was a really great machine and I still recommend it for anyone who's starting out, but I'm ready for this next phase in my career where I can plane larger boards at a faster speed and end up with a smoother, cleaner result. Moving right along, last step in the milling process on all these parts is to cut to final length. I started with the legs. I squared up one end, then used a temporary stop lock, flipped the piece over and cut the other end to final length. Now for the aprons. It was at this point that I realized I glued up two extra short aprons. No big deal though. I ripped one of them in half at the table saw by flipping the piece end for end, then passed those two pieces through my new planer to bring them to final thickness. Problem solved. Back to cutting the aprons to final length. I could just cut them to the length I drew up on the computer, but I like to use real world dimensions instead. The legs are supposed to be three and a half inches thick, but that could be off by a little bit. So it's best to use your actual work pieces as a reference when cutting mating parts. Same process as before, I square up one end on all the parts, then flip the boards over, 
butt them up against a temporary stop block, then cut to final length. This is still a temporary setup here because I was having trouble nailing down the location for my miter saw since I moved into this shop. Happy to report I found its home. Already planning on the miter saw station I'll build here, so stay tuned for that. As per my design, the shelves for this bench will rest in a rabbit cut into all the aprons. Cutting that rabbit was pretty easy to do with a dado stack and a sacrificial fence at the table saw, but it can also be done with a single blade like I'll show for another rabbit later or a router, always options. To join the aprons to the legs, there are also lots of options. I settled on shop made floating tenons. These are like dominoes, but bigger, beefier, stronger, and a little more complicated to pull off. The whole process is made easier with templates though. You can make a template with a drill, jigsaw, and sander like I've done many times in the past, or you can utilize magic routers like the Shaper Origin, which creates perfectly shaped templates. No sanding required. Either way, I like to use a guide bushing with my templates, and the only thing to take into account here is the offset between the bit and the bushing. Math could be used to figure this out, but I don't like math. So I just make one cut on a scrap with a bushing in place and measure the distance between the template and the cut that was made. That's how much bigger you need to make your template. This template will cut all the mortises in all the parts. I wanna make sure the location for these mortises will be consistent. So for the legs, I add a fence on one edge with CA glue. To ensure this template doesn't move, I place really small bits of double-sided tape on the piece, then use a combo square to set it at the correct distance from the end of the leg and clamp it down. Now it's just a matter of plunging down until the set depth until the mortises are made. Super easy. But because these mortises were so deep, I had to plunge a lot of times and it was getting to be quite cumbersome. So I brought the legs over to the drill press to clean out most of the material with a Forstner bit. As you can tell, just like my miter saw, this situation is temporary, but I have ideas. Anyway, the Forstner bit leaves pointy bits that router bits don't like, so I knock those out with a chisel, and then each mortise only needed two plunges to complete. Once all the mortises were cut on the sides of all the legs, I could use the same template to cut the matching mortises on the ends of the aprons. Only this time, I added a fence to a second side so that it can reference two faces. Same process as before, put little bits of double-sided tape on, then clamp the sides of the template in place. I couldn't hold these tall pieces at the drill press and I didn't trust my freehand drilling into end grain, so I just suffered through plunging a billion times to get to final depth. It wasn't too bad. The extra wide base of my six-in-one jig definitely made it more comfortable to manage. Maybe some of you were wondering why there are two different size mortises. Now I'm sure it's clear. I made one shorter so it doesn't interfere with the rabbit cut on the inside for the shelves. Time to make the floating tenons. Using calipers, I measure the height of the mortise, which I'll use to set the table saw fence, then cut a scrap to that width. I did that for both size mortises. Then sent both those pieces through the planer where I just kept raising the bed slightly and testing after each cut until I got a perfect fit. Squaring off all those deep mortises did not sound like a good time, so I rounded off the corners on the planks I just milled up instead. I chose a radius that was slightly bigger than the radius cut on the mortises, so there was a little room for glue to squeeze out the corners. I don't know if that's standard practice, but it just made sense in my mind. And it was really satisfying to do the test fit on these. Once everything was looking good, I can cut those planks up into the floating tenons. Again, I wanted to leave some room for glue, so I cut them just shy of the actual length of both mortises combined. Now that we saw the hard way to do floating tenons, here's the easy way. The two thinner, shorter aprons didn't need those big beefy shot made floating tenons, so the domino made quick work of making those mortises. Those aprons will be used to lock the top down to the base with lag screws. So I need to drill the recessed holes for those screws before assembling it all. First, I drill a stopped hole with a Forstner bit. Then with a smaller bit, I drill all the way through. The depth of the first hole is determined by how much of the screw I want to stick out into the top. And the width of the second through hole is determined by the width of the screw. You want it to be 
slightly larger. My design also calls for a set of dog holes that are on the side of the bench, and this will help support long pieces that are in the vise. Also easier to drill these before assembling the whole base. These are just three quarter inch through holes. Before assembling, I also sanded all the inside faces because those would be hard to reach later. All right, finally, the glue up. I was tempted to glue this all in one fell swoop, but logic took over and I split it up into multiple glue ups. I started with just gluing up the short sides. Each mortise on the leg gets glue, then floating tenons are inserted, both the shop made and the dominoes. Glue is put on those, then more glue is put into the mating mortises on the stretchers, and then they're connected. Repeat on the other end of the stretchers to get the opposite leg in place. And I was able to hammer it mostly home, then brought everything together with clamps. Rinse and repeat for the second short side. Just a side note here. Probably the most important thing I did for this whole build was label these legs. One, two, three, and four. I knew leg one should be by my shop door that goes into my house. Leg two was by my miter saw. Leg three by the shop door that goes into the garage. And leg four was by my clamp wall. I was able to use that same number system for the aprons and also the tops. When you're constantly moving pieces around the shop to do work on them, it's easy to get mixed up. So always being able to reorient myself this way helped prevent any mistakes. And obviously that numbering system would be different in your shop, but I'm just explaining what worked for me. I set those short sides and clamps overnight and came back the following day to connect them with the long aprons. I think I got a little ambitious with this glue up though. Each assembled side had nine mortises, which connected to the nine mortises on the aprons. So I had to get glue in a total of 36 mortises and on 18 floating tenons. I wish I did this math before starting the glue up. In my mind, I was just attaching four of the beefy long aprons and one thin apron with the support dog holes. What I should have done was pre-glued the floating tenons in the aprons, let that set up, then glue the aprons to the side assemblies. That would have made this glue up a little less stressful. Lesson learned. Actually, I think I learned this lesson on a previous project, so lesson was not learned. Hopefully it's actually learned on this one. Time to build the cabinet. And now that the skeleton of the base is done, I can actually use it to work on, which is really cool. These two pieces of three quarter inch ply are going to be the bottom of the cabinet and the top of the cabinet, but they won't be the exact same length. So I just roughly cut them to length at this point so they're easier to manage and rip to width at the table saw. They will both be the same width. These pieces will rest on the rabbits cut on the aprons, but the corners of the legs get in the way, so they'll need to be notched out. I used a combo square butt up against the leg to get the dimensions of the notches, then cut them away with my favorite tool, the jigsaw. These notches will be hidden inside the cabinet, so you're never going to see them if you mess up this cut. Test fit, and we're good. Before cutting the top piece of the cabinet to size, I'll work on the sides. These will have a rabbit that the top will rest on. And I do this for structural reasons and aesthetics because it hides the plywood edges. For the sides, I'm using maple plywood I got from Woodworker Source because I wanted it to match the maple base. I ripped the pieces to width, then cut them to length and cut the rabbit on one edge. I figured I'm only making two rabbits, so there's no need to swap out to a dado stack, right? <laughs> so I removed the bulk of the waste by taking multiple passes at the table saw, moving the fence slightly with each pass. Then I cleaned up both rabbits with a router plane. It worked and it's a nice clean rabbit, but I definitely spent more time with the router plane than it would have taken me to swap out to a dado stack. With the rabbit's cut, I can temporarily put the sides in place to get the length of the cabinet top. To make sure I'll be placing these sides in the same exact spot when I actually install them, I made spacers to keep it all consistent. The length of the cabinet top is the distance from the bottom of each rabbit. So I cut that top piece to final length, notched out the corners the same way I did on the bottom, and did the test fit. Oh yeah! That was probably one of the more satisfying things I've done in my woodworking career. 
I cut the center divider of the cabinet so it's the same height as the top of the upper aprons when resting on the bottom of the cabinet, but those aprons get in the way. So I notched out the corners on this piece as well. Perfect fit. Now the drawback dividers get cut to size based on the actual opening. Last minute decision here. Before assembling this all, I thought it would be a nice touch to edge band the center divider because it will be seen when you open the drawers. While that dried, I did some other things that'll be easier to do before assembling the cabinet, like sand all the outside faces. Easier to do this now because I can flip it to sand each side. While I do that, a word from this week's sponsor, Green Chef. One of my least favorite activities in the world, besides for sanding, is going to the supermarket, but my family needs to eat. Green Chef makes it easy to eat clean, quality food that you can feel good about by delivering these well-organized meal kits right to your door. I've been using Green Chef for a couple of years now and every single meal has been delicious. But the best part, my kids get excited with each package and they want to try new foods. School just started and our after school schedules are busier than ever, which doesn't leave me with a lot of time to cook. Super exciting news, Green Chef just launched their new quick and easy recipes that can be made in 25 minutes or less. It feels great knowing I can prioritize our health and get quality dinners on the table in a flash. Green Chef helps us eat clean and live a healthy lifestyle with 80 plus weekly options to choose from. These recipes are all chef crafted and nutritionist approved. Green Chef makes it easy to eat clean and build healthy eating habits for my little ones. My youngest son will try any veggie that comes in a Green Chef box. To try it out, use my code 63x3custom to get 60% off plus free shipping. Go to greenchef.com for more details. Once again, go to greenchef.com and use my code 60 three by three custom to get 60% off plus free shipping. All right, assembly time. The bottom of the cabinet goes in first. I used glue and brad nails to keep it in place while the glue set up. The glue was dry on the center divider, so I flushed it up with a block plane and trimmed the excess with a flush trim saw. You can also do this at the table saw like I'm doing here. All these cabinet parts will be attached to the base and each other using pocket holes. These will never be seen and no one needs to know they exist except for you and me. This is a shop project after all. I started with the side panels, making sure to get them in their correct locations using the side panel spacers I used earlier. Then locked it all down, making sure to use the pocket hole screws that are meant for hardwood. Next up, the center divider. I used the drawback dividers to get that in its perfect location, then made sure it was square, then locked that down to the bottom panel. The drawback dividers get screwed in place next. There are pocket holes drilled on all edges of these dividers. For now, they're just locked down to the sides, center divider, and bottom. Last up, the top of the cabinet gets placed. And that snap is the best sound in the world. A quick test to see how sturdy and stable this all is. Then the top is attached to the divider with pocket holes from underneath. That's basically it for the base. But as you can see, I am further along in this project. I just needed to split it up into different videos for a few different reasons. As you just watched, there was a lot of detail that went into the base. So even if you don't want to do this whole split top design, or if you don't want to build the drawers, you could just leave this as open shelving or just leave out all of these center dividers and just leave it as a bottom shelf and a top shelf. I think the basic idea of just this base was interesting enough to share on its own, but <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. Another reason why I had to split this up you may have noticed the brace on my ankle in a few of the clips. I sprained my ankle pretty bad while I was building this, so I couldn't work for a few weeks. And now even as I'm working, I'm moving very, very slowly and I'm just being extra careful and I still need to take a lot of breaks. So this build went from being a few week build to a few month build. For the next video, I'm going to focus on building the draws for here, and I'm going to try a new technique that I've never tried before, so it should be a fun experiment. And then I'll go into detail on the tops. I still have to drill all the dog holes, do all the vices, still a lot of work to do, but as soon as I finish it all up, I'll get that video out for you guys. Oh, and let me know if you want plans for this. I haven't been drawing up plans because it takes a lot of time, so if there's enough interest, I will definitely make the time to make the plans. And let me know if you want to see the footage of how I sprained my ankle because I caught it on camera 
<laughs> it was while I was working on this. So stupid, but let me know if that's something that you're interested in seeing. So thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you for part two.